It's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. That's great, it starts with an earthquake, birds, snakes, and aeroplanes. Lenny Bruce is not afraid. I have a hurricane, listen to yourself, turn worlds into don't need stuff. You sing your own life, speed it up, and I speed got no speed. The ladder starts to clatter with the fear of fight down, like fire in a fire, and the southern gang, the government for hiring the combat site. But you wasn't coming in a hurry, but you're it down your neck. Bet you reporters got the Trump paper crap Look at that low plane, fine then Up all over full population corner Blue blood, it'll lose Savior's heaven, Savior's heaven Where else in your own need Listen to your heart Tell me that the rich are in the red room With the right You patriotic, patriotic Slam fight, right my feeling pretty sight It's the end of the world As we know it It's the end of the world As we know it It's the end of the world As we know it And I feel Good morning. So, if your company is faced with a cyber incident, it's not at the end of the world, as the song suggests, but if you don't have a business plan to, and are prepared to face the incident head on, it, it could be the direction you're heading to. So, that slide really indicates a whole lot of companies that have some sort of cyber incident occurring to them in the past. We, we could have let that saw, you know, the, go beyond the song, the number of companies that have been compromised since we built that one slide. It's just an ongoing activity. What we want to do, uh, Mark and I, we want to actually walk through the process of incident response. And as we walk through that, we want to build a context around that with a case study that uh, we're going to interject throughout the, the presentation. And then we're going to sort of wrap it up with some lessons learned. So before we begin, we wanted to set uh, some common language and we, we base it on NIST. So an event is something that is a single occurrence. It's a log entry using your Windows Event Viewer or your syslog or your output from your scene. So it's, it's something very finite. And then we look at uh, incident and that's where we look at a violation or an imminent threat to your security uh, policies, your standards or your practices. And then we look at what breaches, and that's the actual compromise to your corporation's uh, confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your systems or your information. So incident response, the, the way we approach this, we, we approach it in a framework. And one of the key things with the framework is it has to be corporate driven, corporately supported, because in any incident, there's a business cost. And without that support from the, the higher ups, it's just not gonna be something that's gonna work for you. So the key thing is from that uh, support, they give you the authority to run the incident. If you don't have the authority to make decisions, you're handcuffed and you can't move forward. It has to be supported at all levels of management, just not the very top, also in the middle layers. Because typically when you're running an incident, you're gonna be impacting those middle layers by pulling resources. And it has to be funded because as you go through some of the processes, you may need to actually go buy technology or additional resources. And when, the way we have framed it is uh, there, there's five key elements, the plan, detection and analysis, uh, containment and eradication, recovery, and then finally the review process. And although we have developed it this way, you, you have to actually right size it for your organization. You know, whether it's a, a 10 person company, 100 or 100,000, you really need to have a framework, but you need to make it fit the way you run your business. And to kick things off, you know, it, it all starts with the plan because that's the fundamental step. So the idea behind the plan, it creates consistency. And when you have consistency, consistency when you're approaching something that is chaotic, it instills confidence not only in the team that you're running as an incident commander, but also in the management that's looking for answers from you. And you want to make sure your plan is aligning with uh, your business continuity group and your disaster recovery groups, because depending on the scale of the incident, you may be invoking their plans as well as part of yours. And, and with the, the plan, you also have to make sure that uh, as you go through the process and you the incident's over, you're gonna, as we'll talk about, touch on reviewing the things that uh, you've incurred during the incident, 
update your plan and test your plan. So the plan is really your playbook of how you're going to run your incident across, you know, not only this one, but future ones as well. You want to make sure you have the right people. Um, not everybody's cut out to be an incident commander. It's, it really is a tough job, and Mark and I, we've been doing it for a lot of years. And uh, we've, we've actually, you know, looked out to expand the community of incident commanders, and, uh, the, you know, the responses are pretty small. It, it's a tough job. It takes a lot of pressure. You have to be able to handle things quickly on the fly. But we like it. We, you know, it's, it's quite rewarding when you finish things up and you look back at what you accomplished. Within the computer emergency response team itself, you need to make sure you're identifying the, ro the roles across your corporations, though the key IT systems uh, or processes that you have out there, so whether it's server, desktop, service desk, uh, communications, and so on, you gotta have those roles identified and make sure you've actually assigned people to those roles and not just one level but two deep because some people go on vacation, you always wanna make sure that that's covered off. And going back to that first slide about uh, corporately supported, so when you look at uh, pulling resources away from the day-to-day -day job, management's going to get a little nervous because suddenly projects, deadlines, everything sort of slows down because you've pulled those resources away. So you need to make sure you have that commitment up front. And again, uh, should you need it, you need to have that approval for, to spend money and you need to know what kind of budget scope you have for that. So to start off looking at, uh, you come in the morning and something's wrong. Now, if it's a noisy attack that's happening, you know, it's pretty simple. Things aren't working. So the network's down or email doesn't respond or something's happened. It's pretty obvious that there's a problem. It gets a little more interesting when it gets, uh, you know, a little more stealthy, you know, are the attacks time-based? Are they obfuscated? Uh, you know, are they evading your detection systems? Uh, this is the kind of thing that you might uh, start getting back from uh, reports from your seam on your dashboard saying, okay, we're starting to correlate a lot of those logs, those events, and now we're starting to understand that there's a problem that's shaping up and you're going to have that imminent threat. Uh, so we know something's up. We start trying to understand the vector. How, how is this uh, incident form formulating on the outside of your network and trying to knock on your door? Uh, looking at who the actors are, is it uh, hacktivists, is it uh, nation state, or some other form of cyber criminal? Uh, is it targeted? Are you the actual victim or are you collateral damage? You know, you know, is it just a shotgun approach out across the internet and trying to pick up as many corporations to hit as possible? Then you start looking at uh, the size of the actual, whether it's an outbreak, uh, so from a malware kind of standpoint, is it one server, is it 10 desktops, is it spreading across your network quickly and growing that size, you know, it's, it's happening very quickly. And that's gonna actually influence some of your decision making as an incident commander. What are the steps we have to do and how fast do we have to do it? And then, you, you know, looking at, uh, are they using pivot points, uh, hitting the one box in your DMZ and coming across some other holes that may be visible to them? So now that we've, figured out something's wrong. We got a sort of an idea, okay, this is bigger than normal malicious activity that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We start to look at, we have to actually activate our plan and declare an incident and identify the incident commander. And that's really key because then the incident commander takes over and runs the whole show. So you call in your computer emergency response team, you get people focused, you get, you stand up your incident command center and that can be either a physical command center or it could be virtual. So if it's three in the morning, it's gonna be virtual. And by, you know, if it's the next day that it's still going on, you might make it a physical one in one of the boardrooms. So uh, we have set up a command center physically within our uh, building so that we can have that uh, boardroom set up with uh, video conferencing and really good communication equipment but we also have our set up so that we can do it virtually. So it's really good to be part of your plan to do that. So I'm gonna hand over to Mark, who's gonna start uh, get diving into our case study. Thanks, Ken. Can you guys hear me okay? So I wanna take a poll. How many people from Ottawa in the room? <laughs> How many recognize the picture on the, on the screen? All right, a lot less than I thought, actually. So this is what we're calling the dancing banana case study. And 
For those of you from Ottawa or who recognize this page, this was the City of Ottawa's web page back in November 2014. It was taken over and we had a message targeted that was basically replacing customer access to the city's page with this one. You'll notice this message has been obfuscated. I've cut out certain parts of it and I'll explain to you later in the presentation why. So this is where I get into my storytelling. We're gonna start off by what I call the perfect world. It's Friday evening around 5.30, 17.30 in the evening. You're out with a buddy of yours, you're enjoying a really good meal, plan to go to a movie afterwards. Perfect way to end a hectic week and start the perfect weekend. I'm gonna step into what I call the real world. 17.30 on a Friday evening. You're out for dinner with your buddy. You have plans to go to a movie. I was on call and received a notification that the City of Ottawa webpage had been received with a dancing banana. I kind of sat there and I went, pardon? <laughs> so I pulled out my Blackberry. This was 2014. Took a look and I was like, okay, Ottawa webpage looks fine to me. So the technician who called me, I said, are you sure? He says, yeah, I see a dancing banana in front of me. I said, do me a favor, dig into it just a little more and give me a call back. Now, two minutes after I hung up the phone with our technician, my personal cell phone exploded. I had messages coming in from my friends, left, right, and center. CBC is reporting that Ottawa.ca has been hacked. Did our webpage get hacked? Do you know what's going on? My wife texted me, are you coming home tonight? First words out of my mouth, check please. Night ended. We were moving to DEF CON 1. So these are the facts. City of Ottawa webpage was defaced by a hacktivist and replaced with a dancing banana with a message targeting the Ottawa Police Department. Our hacktivists didn't know that the Ottawa Police are actually have their own web space and are separate from the City of Ottawa, but we're one big happy family, so let's just start with the one I know about. The media reports had been circulating that the webpage had been hacked. Confusion initially set in because everybody wasn't seeing the same thing. Like I said, some people were seeing the dancing banana. On my phone, I was seeing the normal City of Ottawa webpage. So at this point, I knew we had a problem. Pulled out the phone tree, called, it, called immediately to the management. I said, we've got a major issue here. They're like, we already know. You're the incident commander. We're declaring formal incident. This is the support Ken was talking about. There was no dilly-dallying around to say, do we do something, do we not do something? It was basically all boots on the ground at that point. Let's figure out what's going on. So what we did initially is we had a really small core response team initialized to determine what was going on. This included myself as the incident commander. We had leadership roles established amongst the various groups. So we had technical leads assigned, we had web leads assigned, we had management leads assigned, and we had communication leads assigned. We ensured the maximum safe duration right at the beginning, and I can't stress this enough. How many people here have actually worked through an incident? How many have established shift duration times? During an incident, most people, they want to help. They want to do nothing but help and solve the problem. I call it the hero factor. After about 10 hours, they become pretty much ineffective. They're tired, they're exhausted. Make sure when you're building your plans, you do have a 10-hour coverage on it or 12, whatever you're comfortable in your organization. You do not want it to carry over because if you're making decisions with people who have had no sleep, no rest, it's gonna hurt you in the end. The big one at the bottom, you're gonna hear me talk about this multiple times throughout the presentation. Start your incident log immediately. Capture everything that you know. Times, date stamps, conference calls, conversations, all the people who are in the room, all the decisions that'll be made. Now I know in the technical world we like to do things, dig in, just start solving the problem. As an incident commander or part of the response team, the documentation is your lifeline and the most important part. An incident could run for two hours, it could run for eight, it could run for eight days. The key is you may be looking at things four days down the road that you looked at already and eliminated as possibilities. The log allows you to go back and determine the steps that you and your team have taken at that point. The other reason I say document, 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 you never know if your organization is going to be liable and taken to court on it. Everything you do will help at the end of the day if you have it written down. We have an advantage at the City of Ottawa. It's called the Office of Emergency Management, and it's basically a collective of all the city departments. 
They have response people on call every weekend. We can reach out to departments and actually notify, let them know of things like situational awareness or if we're actually turned into a full response mode. We leverage this immediately. It gave us connectivity into all the city departments to let them know what was happening, how it was impacting them, and what we were doing in the response phase for it. The interesting thing about the city is we have 200 different services that we offer or more. The thing with the Ottawa.ca webpage was who's on first? Who actually owns this incident? The reason IT took the incident was because we had the years of experience of handling the incidents between Ken and myself, but also because the business trusted that based on our past performance, they knew that they didn't have the capability to run this type of thing. Ken talked about the analysis phase. So we knew we had a problem. Now we gotta figure out what exactly is it and why is it happening? So what we determined was the goal of the hacktivist was to draw attention to a case in which a 16-year-old teen was arrested for swatting by the Ottawa police. So this is a big point. I've heard other presentations talk about this. During an incident, keep your eyes on the news. Local papers, social media, Facebook, Twitter, everything that's going on. When attacks like this happen, these, these guys, they like to talk about it. They like to brag, they like to show that they're in charge. Every piece of information you can gather can help benefit you in the end. See, our attacker was freely blogging on social media, but they were also engaged with the media. The media does us no favors during an incident because they continue. It's a news story, right? What are you going to do next? When can we expect? What do we do? And it's like, okay, we're trying to mitigate this, and you guys are just bringing it to the forefront. So we determined what had happened. We hadn't necessarily been hacked as far as the web page was concerned. It was our domain namespace registrar was social engineered. The attacker got access to it and actually redirected to a malicious site in the States. And that's where the Dancing Banana was hosted from. All our stuff was fine. It was still there. It was the fact that they overtook this and did the redirection. At this point, log gets updated. We learned, we figured out what was going on, and we also dug into it with our response team on the domain registrar. We said, get in there, figure out what happened, how it happened, and why it happened, and plug that hole. Ken? All right, thanks, Mark. So, you've detected something, you figured out uh, sort of uh, who's trying to hit you, how big this is, now you gotta really start looking at stopping the damage. And that's where we started looking at containment. So depending on the type of attack and uh, who it's coming from, you, you got to look at what can I do from my end. For starting, when you're sitting around the command center and you're looking to your technical resources, you know, what are my perimeter controls that I can either enable to do more or disable to allow less? Looking at uh, if it's an email kind of born attack, is it a a malicious attachment, so you start filtering attachments, or if it's a spam with bad links, you start filtering based on subjects. So looking at what things you can invoke to just start uh, reducing the exposure that you have of, of this particular threat. One of the things that we should all be doing as proactive uh, measures is patching our systems, but sometimes you hit those zero days. So within your, your incident response team, you gotta make sure, again, looking at your roles, that you have the right people around the table so that uh, they're prepared when the vendors produce a new patch so they can get pushed out in uh, a more uh, aggressive nature versus the usual you know, three days, four days, or weeks of QA. You gotta get it rolled out quickly. And it's the same thing with your antivirus guys. When you get your, uh, you're working with your vendors, get your definitions, you gotta be able to push them out quickly when they arrive because sometimes that is the way or your method that you're gonna contain the spread of this. You know, again, you gotta start thinking of maybe it's uh, separating your network. Uh, maybe you're gonna start uh, looking at uh, segmentation. Uh, if there's a certain segment that's being hit more, maybe you have to separate it before it spreads to the rest of your network. So you gotta look at maybe utilizing VLANs or other kind of network technologies to really try and put a slow to things. Once you sort of got to that containment stage of things are sort of slowed down or hopefully stopped, but you still have the bad stuff out there. And you've got to start looking, well, how do I get rid of it? And again, looking at whether or not you uh, are taking your infected systems offline 
or you're just uh, VLANing them somewhere so that you can work them while still in a controlled state. Uh, those are the kind of things you got to look at. It, you know, password attacks. We see the credential stealing as uh, you know something that's an ongoing uh, activity. You may have to send out you know corporate communications to say, okay, as a corporation, we all need to change our passwords immediately, kind of thing. So you got to look at what are, what kind of things measures can you do to mitigate that risk. It doesn't sound pretty when you do those corporate announcements, but those are the kind of things sometimes you have to do. Looking, as, as Mark said, uh, you know, keep your ear to the ground, what's going on on the outside. Looking at uh, your, your resources, we have uh, CSERT here, and you look at SANS and US CERT and other forums out there, looking at uh, what are the indicators of compromises out there that they've tabulated, and can you search for those in your environment to try and again look at, uh, I, I've sort of mitigated my risk, I remove stuff, is it still talking? Because the unfortunate thing is, if you don't re-image boxes, you're trying to get things, you know, there's a lot of pressure to get things out there quickly to back into the business world. And so you remove the malware, is that enough? Or is it still talking because there was actually another piece of software that you didn't know was a payload and it's communicating out? So you gotta really look at your, you know, what other uh, groups are talking about to help identify, can I trust that system? Mark touched on it briefly with uh, your logs and the importance of the logs. If whatever the incident may be within your corporation uh, has the possibility of a legal action, you gotta start looking at what, what do I need to keep? Uh, the logs are definitely number one and you have to keep it in some form of a forensically defensible means and uh, maintain something called chain of custody with it because if your logs are not kept in a proper uh, methodology to support that, then they'll just get thrown out in court that somebody else tampered with them. So you gotta sort of get that appreciation that I'm just not going in there to clean things up and get things back into uh, the business world and get uh, our lines of business up and running. It's the after effect well, now we can't prosecute somebody who came in and did something malicious because we didn't take that care. Uh, one of the things we've seen an awful lot uh, as, as incident commanders is red herrings. Uh, these, these are things that somebody brings up a, a new concept, new idea, and around the incident command table, you gotta make sure that it's relevant. And you don't wanna dismiss it because it may become relevant down the road. So you wanna throw it in the parking lot. And as you know, the incident grows over time, you actually might start seeing some threads that start saying, yeah, that, that makes sense now, so let's pull it out of the parking lot and start dealing with it. But you don't wanna start chasing these uh, ideas. You're just gonna lose your resources and you're not gonna focus on the end game. One of the, the things that even though we're experienced as commanders, we're not the technical experts. You got to rely on your subject matter experts. They are the people, the boots on the ground. They know the systems the best. Trust them. That is the key to being a good instant commander is having trust in your team. Mark? Thanks, Ken. So as Ken was talking, the containment and eradication, this is the process of taking control of your organization back from the attacker. You identify the root cause, and you modify procedures to tighten your security. Like I said, we realized it was our domain name registrar that was taken over. We talked to them immediately, we figured out what happened, and we also implemented new processes immediately so this wouldn't happen again. We said, get in there, change this. We'll deal with the effect of why it happened after the incident, but right now, it's the containment portion. This was done in less than two hours. We were really quick on the response. We had a lot of smart people in the room and they knew right off the bat what the root cause was. When you're doing your containment eradication, identify your team leads. Now, here's an interesting scenario, and it's a belief of ours is, your team leads don't always have to be management types. They don't always have to be leaders. They could be the subject matter experts in the area. They're people who are willing to work well with others, as well as work well with the incident commander. These are the kind of people that are gonna make your team effective. These are the personality traits you wanna look for. So we had the specific areas, which was the domain registrar, the communication team, and the senior management lead. Our communication team, we were fortunate enough because we could span out to the corporate communication group at the city of Ottawa. How do we build our messaging? Ken and I aren't messaging experts. We're really good writers, 
But at the end of the day, it's all about the organization. They may have another way of how they want to structure the messaging. We provide the input, they do the final product. Senior management lead, if you're in a large scale organization, this is essential. You basically get somebody dealing with the management because if they're in the know and they're updated on a regular basis, they're not gonna be calling the incident commanders and asking what's going on. This is a big key. You wanna ensure consistent messaging is going out. The one thing you wanna establish as part of your plan is who is responsible and allowed to comment on the incident. In our plan, the incident commanders are the only ones who authorize any of the communication messaging. This stops the game of Purple Monkey Dishwasher, which was actually, we had our web page redirected. You don't want other people commenting because everybody gets a different message. You wanna make sure that the incident commander sends out the consistent message. Everybody is talking about the same thing. So with the successful containment, we moved on to the next phase. So this was around eight o'clock at night. We figured out what it was, we knew what was going on, and we were ready to move on. We had the computer continued support of the senior leadership because we kept them updated. The other thing is, once we knew everything that was going on, what did we do? We updated the log. Keep your lifeline going. Oh. Over yep. to you, Ken. Yep, thanks. So we've cleaned things up. We need to start restoring services. So when does that start? And realistically, every scenario you look at it and it says it depends. It depends on a lot of factors. It depends on how big this was. It depends on how many resources you have. You gotta look at, you know, can I trust the systems if I just delete the malware? You know, is that something that you as a business are willing to accept? Or is it, the only way I can trust it is to reimage, And reimaging takes a little more time. So do I have the resources and the people to do that? Uh, if I have to restore services on, uh, or servers, do I have the backups on site? Do I have, do I have to start calling them back from our offsite uh, vendor that has them? Uh, how long does it take to get them back? Uh, are the people who are doing these restores the same people doing the containment and the re-imaging, you know, again, coming back to your resource pool? So how fast things can happen is really dependent on, on uh, how big it is and how many people you have. So if you have a different uh, data back, uh, backup and restore team, as this uh, instant commander, you can make sure those guys are on tap already and calling back tapes while you're still in the previous phases because by the time you're ready for them, your tapes are on site ready to roll. One of the things that uh, you, you really have to look at in, in a larger scale incident is, you know, do I need to talk to my BCP folks? Uh, the business continuity plan and the people around that plan, uh, they're the ones that are gonna help you in uh, the process of recovery. Because if, if, what Mark said, we have over 200 lines of businesses, if we stood up in a room of all those businesses and said, well, who needs to come up first? You're gonna get this across the board. Well, we can't operate that way. We have to bring things up in a, in a proper and orderly manner, both from a technical standpoint of which things technically have to come up first, but we rely on our BCP and our Office of Emergency Management to set the tone of, well, which actual systems and businesses need to come up first. And in our case, it's always life safety, anything that affects life safety. The other thing you have to really look at is not only within your specific emergency response team around the table, but the people working with them around the, the board, because if these are long incidents, you're, you're gonna look at uh, stressing them out. They're gonna get a lot of sleep deprivation. You know, they're, they're, they wanna, as Mark says, they wanna all be heroes, and you gotta really be careful of that. Sometimes you have to look at, as in skin manner, is recognizing, okay, I'm, I'm losing my focus of the team. I, I'm not getting the same value from them. We need to either uh, bring in some external resources to help compensate for uh, you know, the, the team members. So, and and that, that could actually have a, a benefit in the sense that if you have a large scale of recovery, so say you have 100 or 1,000 systems off the network because they have to all be re-imaged, it's probably a lot easier to sign a check and have an external company come in with your image and start hitting machines on a 24 by 7 basis until they're all up. 
All right. Thanks, Ken. So we're into the recovery phase now, and this is the road back to normal operations. There was a bit of a kicker. The web page had a time to live of 24 to 48 hours, so our hands were tied at that point. You gotta remember, this was Friday evening, around 20 hundred hours. We couldn't do anything until the page replicated out. So we kind of shut our team down a bit. We had a few people monitoring, saying some people, who's monitoring Bell, who's monitoring Rogers, who's looking at our data feed coming in, and let us know when we actually start seeing the site come back. It took two days to replicate out. And basically, this was across the world. And we established the continuous monitoring, and we kept telling the senior leadership, just be patient, it's gonna happen. It just takes some time. As the incident commander, I started feeling a little better. We're moving back to DEF CON 5, normal operations, everybody's happy now. By 0800 on Sunday morning, this is pretty much what the city page looked like. It was back to normal, everything had been restored, citizens were accessing the site again, business was continuing to flow. Ken and I felt pretty good at this point. We're like, okay, keep the monitoring going, so we put the observation on. We said, great. Keep an eye on this for the next 24 hours. Let's see how it plays out. 24 hours later. Monday, November 24th at 0800 hours. Web page inaccessible. My heart dropped and we were right back to DEF CON 1. The cycle starts again. It's what I call my what's up doc moment. The page was there, but it disappeared. What are we, what's going on now? We just took care of one problem, another one's gonna rear its ugly head. Ottawa.ca was unresponsive. We were being hit with a large scale DDoS and we had protection in place, we just didn't have enough to sustain the level of damage that was being caused and the number of hits we were seeing. Attack was a large quantity and our technology safeguards couldn't defend against. We kicked off the cycle again, and we started right back at the discovery phase to say, what's going on? The fact we hadn't shut the incident down saved us from having to declare. It was just the continuous movement in the cycle. So we kept our eyes on the news, again, freely discussing with the media. Our attacker was tweeting again, and you know we were able to determine why it was happening. So here's the problem I was talking about earlier as to why I obfuscated the web page. The media always brings the attacker's name to the forefront. This gives them all the power in the world. It gives them credibility. It gives them a showcase on the big stage. I treat the attackers basically the same way as I see serial killers. The only reason we remember them is because the media puts their name in the paper, not the victim's name. When we refer to it, it's either the attacker, the, attacker, the proponent, it's never their name. We choose not to use their name because we try to take away as much power as we possibly can. So this is where it got interesting. This is where multiple business units got together and made a really good business decision really quickly. We decided to increase the level of protection to protect against the large scale DDoS. We put extra security measures in place within a quick period of time and it lasted only for 12 hours. We were back up and running by about nine o'clock on Monday evening. So the safeguards went in and we worked with the communications and the IR team to let people know. The decision was made to take the page offline. And the reason this is, think about this. You can have 700,000 citizens calling the 311 office to say, why is your page unresponsive? Why is your page unresponsive? As opposed to page down for maintenance. Experiencing a technical issue, you give that same consistent message to your public operators that they can give to the community. And people are less likely to call back and say what's going on if they know that something's actually happening. As opposed to, well, we're not sure we're looking into it. So as I said, they were implemented within 12 hours. Ottawa.ca was back online. We noticed the continued attempts to try to spring it down, but they were unsuccessful. We noticed continued attempts against the domain registrar to try and breach them. The safeguards we put in mitigated that risk. By this point, we were moving back to DEF CON 5 normal operations, and I was feeling a lot better because this time it lasted. Ken? Thanks, Mark. So, we're now at the stage that uh, you know, things are coming back to normal and we're certainly feeling a lot better as incident commanders and also as the general emergency response team. So we gotta start 
as an incident commander, again, Mark had touched on that we're responsible for that communication to create that single view uh, going forward. And so you prepare your management update, giving a good scenario, what occurred, and more importantly, because they're always really interested in what is the business impact? How much money did we lose? How many services had stopped? You know, those are the kind of things that you need to sort of describe in a very uh, C-suite kind of level language what that business impact was and also indicate that we're comfortable now, that we're ready to stand down the incident. And that's really important because only the incident commander can stand down the incident and by doing so releases the emergency response team members. And so that's gonna put those resources back into the regular day-to-day -day work, but they can't really leave until you as an incident commander release them because the whole idea is that the team is there to mitigate the impact to the company and reduce whatever the attacker footprint is to something that is now sort of the normal noise, if you will, of an ongoing day-to-day -day operation of your uh, IT center. One thing we, we touched on is, uh, you know, if there's some sort of legal action coming out of the incident. And so as a post activity, even though you stood down the command center, you as an incident commander now have to start dealing with your legal office and again, depending on what it is, potentially external law enforcement. So you have to be you know, uh, ready to provide those logs in some sort of, uh, again, forensic package that they can defend in court. You gotta, one of the, the, the things that you also wanna do is look at uh, the after action report and the team brief. The team brief is gonna really capture what went well and what didn't went, go well. And you really want to emphasize the what didn't go well because every time you identify those gaps in your plan, that allows you to update your plan so the next incident response will be that much better. Those gaps, Sometimes it's not just the plan itself, but there's architectural changes maybe gets identified as part of those gaps. And so in the after action report, that gets presented to management and then management will actually apply resources and timeframes and possibly budget to those to make sure that those gaps get filled. And then as Mark and I, we've, we've consistently go through these processes, you're always updating the plan. The, the plan will just age out, sit on the shelf collecting dust if you don't continually update it. And you know, that, that's just something that is by default uh, your process as its commanders. Mark? Thanks, Ken. The debrief to me is one of the biggest pieces where you get the most value out of information you receive. We ran ours within 48 hours. Try to hold it within the first 72. It's not always possible to do a hot wash eight hours or 12 hours after the initial incident. Resources are exhausted. They're tired, they're done. You need to give them time to sit down, but you wanna make sure it's enough time that they don't forget what they actually did. As Ken said, we identified what worked well. We looked at the gaps in our response plan, and I wanna draw attention to this. When you're talking about your gaps, you're always talking about the gaps in the plan. You're not looking at the gaps in your people because at the end of the day, the people are relying on the plan that is developed by your organization. Don't draw attention to what Jimmy or Joey did. Draw attention to where the gap failed Jimmy or Joey and how they couldn't do their job because there was a gap in your plan. Make sure people have an anonymous channel. This is key, you will get the most honest feedback in the world coming from the anonymous if you're not, it's because not everybody's presenting in front of people. They don't like to speak in front of them. They may, want to, may not want to share their opinion. But if you give them an anonymous channel, they'll be more than happy to tell you exactly what went wrong. So as Ken was saying, the ICs work throughout the incident. It's busy, it's hectic. The big piece starts when it's all over. Taking all the documentation, taking the log files, taking what's occurred and putting it all together in that final after action report to put together the recommendations and improvements for the organization as a whole. And that's it for the case study. And basically the next is a reflection from an incident commander's perspective. And you'll see the big red easy button's been modified. Don't panic. If you get in the role of being an IC, take it easy, be calm, Know that you're surrounded by the right people who are gonna help get you through this incident. 
Trust in the expertise. Ken mentioned this earlier. Your SMEs, those are the people who are going to get you through this. I talked about it throughout the presentation. Maintain the incident log. It's the lifeline. It's going to bail you out at the end if you have any legal troubles. Ken mentioned, make sure the chain of custody stays on it. Keep your senior leaders updated. If they know what's going on in regular intervals, they're not going to bother you. They're not going to see what's going on. We've established regular cycles, and I basically tell our senior leaders, I'll provide you with an update at 12. I'll give you another update at 4. And if we're not doing any activity tonight, you'll get a, an update at 8 o'clock in the morning. I haven't had any pushback, and everybody's been more than receptive from the senior leadership side to say, this is perfect for us. We get exactly what we need. And there's always room to improve in the plan. If you want it sooner, we can adapt. We can accommodate. Promote staff to position to leadership in the chain. Giving people control over staff reduces egos in the room. You may have people who say, that's my network ops team, and you don't have control over them. Well, actually, it's my incident response team, so I do. How would you like to be the team lead for network ops? Well, that'd be great. They're more than happy to jump on board and work with you, and it makes the whole room a lot easier. Know what your people are doing. The reason I say this is I have it as a personal practice to know what everybody on the incident has done. Little things that they've done to achieve. I fix this, Johnny fix this, Joey fix this, Susie fix that. When our incident's over, I typically put together a management briefing and I basically say one activity that each person did. I found that by identifying the tasks that your team take, even if it's a large team of 25 to 30 people, goes a lot further than, thanks team, you all did a great job. Your senior leaders don't know who are involved. The management team doesn't know who's involved. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from my responders in this, and they absolutely love it. And this goes back. Oh, I already covered that. Okay. All right. So as we're wrapping up uh, this presentation, just want to touch on a couple key components. The, the first one is, in your plan, you have to make sure that there's a role identified that has the authority to declare an incident. If you come in in the morning and there's a problem and everyone's scrambling trying to figure out, well, where do we go next? You have to make sure that somebody within, uh, you know, whether it's management or uh, you know, the CIO or the CISO, somebody has to have that authority documented that they can declare an incident because when you declare an incident, it costs money. You've got resources, you've got uh, business that's down. Uh, these things all impact your regular day-to-day -day stuff, so you want to make sure somebody has that authority to kick things off. You want to make sure the roles are properly identified across your organization that are required to make sure your incidents run smoothly and make sure they're properly staffed. Your communications uh, is, is very important, as Mark's touched on a couple of times, having that consistent message going out and uh, Depending on where your message goes, we have a communication team within the city that we depend on for doing any kind of uh, public communications to make sure the right words are being used to instill confidence into the citizen base. You don't want a technical person uh, looking at, uh, you know, sending out a technical response and creating panic. And Mark touched on the duration. We use a 10 hour duration with a two hour warm handoff, so at hour eight, you know, the next shift is lined up and handing off and learning and understanding the flow so you have that consistency. Uh, Mark touched on, uh, you know, your incident log, standardize it. Standardize your after action report, you know, your debrief template. All these things build that consistency and confidence in the process. You know, we always have our boss's phone number handy and obviously the CERT member phone numbers. So the takeaways from a successful IR methodology are gain your corporate commitment. Ken's talked about this throughout the presentation. Get them to support and endorse it. You want to build the plan. Remember, it's not a static plan you build once and put on the shelf. It's a living document. It will be updated, it will be changed, and it will grow after every incident. Test the plan annually at a minimum. I can't stress this enough how many people I've talked to who have IR teams that have not tested any of their response plans. Take the time, invest in it to build the plan, build some tabletops, build some awareness sessions, let people know what's out there. Otherwise, when your incident kicks off, people are coming into the room going, what do I do? And the key is update the plan annually. If you're fortunate enough to not have an incident, go back annually and look at it and say, is there anything anybody else in the, in the world learned that I can update my incident response plan with? 
that ends our presentation. Thank you very much, and the floor is open for questions.